Now, welcome back to our friends of Endoscopy, Endoscopy News Podcast. Uh, and also thank you to our sponsors at uh, Pentax Medical for your support. Um, as usual, I've trawled the medical journals to look for the most interesting endoscopy-related uh, publications and the most ridiculous ones. Uh, today, the topics are Barrett's and endoscopic resections, including one on ergonomics, which is important. We also got some publications on post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer, performance of cholangioscopy and bleeding. Now, the first study to discuss uh, was from the Netherlands. Uh, it's uh, part of the Dutch nationwide registry of RFA cases, including 1,386 patients. 27% of patients underwent RFA because of low-grade dysplasia, 30% because of high-grade dysplasia, and surprisingly, the majority were offered RFA for early cancer. And of course, that is a contraindication uh, with the BSG. In the UK, we cannot offer patients with Barrett's intubucosal cancer RFA. The study group concluded that about 10% of patients had very poor healing after RFA. That's uh, defined as visible ulceration and inflammation for uh, extending for longer than three months after the RFA session. Of course, here in the UK, we usually leave three months between RFA sessions to allow complete healing. About 50% of patients who had visibly poor healing after three months did actually eventually heal their esophagus and about half of them actually had a good squamous response and the other half presumably didn't and uh, failed their RFA. Anyway, predictors of a poor healing response was high BMI, longer stretch of barriers and visible reflux esophagitis above the um, squamous columnar junction. Um, presumably, that's actually the crux of the matter. Patients who have the most reflux are also the least likely to respond well to RFA, essentially. I should add one more to the list of bad prognostic markers, and that is previous radiotherapy to the esophagus. In Leeds, we stopped actually offering that to patients who had previous radiotherapy because these patients, in our experience, never seem to do well with RFA. This study was published in Endoscopy in the June edition and it was entitled Incidents and Outcomes of Poor Healing After RFA for Early Barrett's Neoplasia. I would argue that early intermucosal cancer is not really early neoplasia, it's rather advanced neoplasia. But there we are, semantics I guess. Now moving on, we have another study published in GI Endoscopy in June the 14th, entitled Evaluation of Polypectomy Quality in Flat Polyps on the Dutch National Bowel Cancer Screening Cohort. Uh, basically, the Dutch have a national Dutch screening cohort uh, and they looked at the data between 2014 and 17 uh, looking at predictors and outcomes of removing flat polyps. Basically they found that uh, size was the main predictor of uh, risk of local recurrence. Uh, with uh, each 10 millimeter increase in polyp size the clinical success rate dropped by about 10%. So in a polyp up to three centimeter in size, the success rate was about 95%, but this dropped to 85% when the polyps were in the three to four centimeter size and polyps larger than four centimeter, the chance of success was only about 75%, corresponding to about a 25% risk of a local recurrence. Now Merlin's their van der Zander and Bogie proposed that uh, further training, quality monitoring, and maybe sending larger polyps to a few dedicated centers might be the, the way ahead. I think this is because they found that about 7% of benign polyps were actually set for surgery because they were seen as too large for an endoscopic attack. Hemicolectomy per se is not a big deal, but of course it's linked with a mortality rate, which we don't really have in endoscopic resection. I was also 
I feel inclined really to point the authors to our SMSA scoring system here in the UK, which has been validated by Ian Leeds, for example, in 2018, which basically is a is a more thorough framework looking not just at size, but at the polymorphology, the site and how, how good the access is to the lesion to grade polyps from easy to difficult to remove. Why don't you use that in Holland? Anyway, it's far from me to tell the, the, the Dutch what to do. They wouldn't listen anyway. So we'll move on to the second paper. Now, of course, the SMSA score only looks at uh, EMR and polypectomy. There is no corresponding uh, tool to predict a difficult colonic EST. However, a study from China published uh, a few years ago from GI endoscopy by Li Qi and Xu in China concluded that size, increasing size was a poor predictor. Location at a colonic flexure was a poor predictor of success and non-granular lesions. So basically the LSTs, granular type lesions are easier to remove. The non-granular ones lift poorly and are more difficult to remove. You know, if you if you if you listen to ESDEists, they quote hundred percent success rates. But this large Chinese center, I think, were a bit more realistic, and reported that in the easiest lesions, the chances of success for ESD was about seventy five percent, which dropped to about seventeen percent in patients with the most difficult lesions. That's probably real life data, isn't it? So clearly ESD is not really ready for all colonic lesions. Good to see that there's still room for the good and trusty EMR. <laughs> I could have told you so. Of course, the ESDs would point to a recent paper in GI endoscopy entitled Pocket Creation versus Conventional ESD, a meta-analysis to say that, look, this is all old data. Well, it isn't really. And uh, now we use the pocket creation ESD, and that is much more successful. Indeed, this study from, again, China, Pei, Kia, Chao and Zhang, uh, reported that the success rate with the pocket creation method, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this method, but basically, instead of cutting around the lesion and then kind of dissecting it from edge to edge, you basically tunnel underneath it to start with, and then from underneath the lesion dissect outwards and, and resect it kind of from inside and out. The success rate in this Chinese group was 94% for the pocket creation method compared to 78% with a standard method. It also seemed a little bit safer with a, an adverse event rate of 4% versus 7%. Anyway, the difference was big enough to basically tell us that the pocket creation method is probably the the way we should do ESD lesions in the colorectum. Now there have been developments in the good old EMR as well. And I came across a study in the American Journal of Gastro from uh, last month in May on something called tip-in endoscopic mucosal resection. I'm not sure if you heard of that. Basically, uh, it's for lesions in the kind of 15 to 25 millimeter size range when it'd be nice to ensure a single piece resection. You embed the tip of the snare beyond the polyp into the submucosal layer and then drape it over the lesion. And by doing that, the success rate in 41 lesions removed was 90% versus 73% in patients randomized to have lesions removed in the standard way. The media procedure time was seven minutes for the tip-in approach versus five minutes for the standard EMR. Uh, so it only took an extra two minutes to embed the tip. Of course, there are there are snares with little spikes in the tip to allow this. Personally, I don't use the spike tip side. So I prefer the super stiff snares, which basically does the same job. By the way, there was no difference in the adverse event rate, but I don't think 41 lesions will be enough to really comment on that. If you want to read up on the tip-in EMR technique, look it up at the American Journal of Gastroenterology, the 26th of May, 21. Of course, the disadvantage of the super stiff snares uh, that I use is that the perforation rate goes up. <laughs>
I rather suspect that the perforation rate, if you do enough of these lesions, will, will be found in larger studies to be a bit greater with a tip-in technique as well. But um, as yet, that is not proven. So is there anything we can do to reduce the risk of local recurrence after chronic EMR? Well, there was a meta-analysis uh, published in Surgical Endoscopy in uh, last week's June edition entitled Endoscopic Techniques to Reduce Local Recurrence Rate After Colorectal EMR, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. Authors are Kemper, Turan and Schon. Basically, this is um, a study between the Netherlands and Germany, and they looked at uh, 1,335 lesions in published studies. And uh, they looked at ways we have to reduce the risk of lo uh, local recurrence, which includes APC, or using just the tip of the snare, setting the diatherm to uh, soft coagulation, perhaps extending the EMR to a bit of the nearby normal looking mucosa, as well as pre-cutting EMR, where you actually cut a trench around the lesion to start with and then remove the lesion in the center piecemeal. Anyway, there's no difference between all these four techniques and the pooled risk reduction. If you applied one of these techniques was 0.37. Uh, so basically, if you take care and look for remaining neoplastic tissue and then do something about it, you'd end up with a lower risk of local recurrence. APC does go around the corner, doesn't it? So if you can put that APC probe over the crest of a fold and treat the mucosal defect, the edge of the mucosal defect, beyond what you can see without having to retrovert the scope, etc., which after a 45-minute EMR might actually be beyond what the patient can tolerate. And I came across this paper from the Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology entitled Favorable Long-Term Outcomes After EMR for Duodenal NETs in a Non-Ampullary Position. Basically, these guys from Osaka published the result of 34 NETs in the duodenum and reported that uh, their R0 resection rate was 59%. Well, hold on a second. That's not that good, is it? But of course, any when you remove NETs, they they do grow quite deep in the submucosal plane, and you, in my experience, almost always have the histopathologist saying that the deep margin is very tight. It's 0.1 millimeter, hundred less than 100 microns, so they can't really confirm the deep roots of the lesions had been removed. But almost always, it has been. The median size of the NET was only six millimeters. Oh, for goodness sake, I was hoping for good news here. Mean size of the NET, six millimeter. The largest they had was 13 millimeters. Oh, heck, um, there's gonna be less good news than I expected. And reading on, six lesions, that's 18%, had lymphovascular invasion. Four patients, that's 12% of the group, suffered a perforation during their duodenal EMR. Fortunately, they were able to close these perforations uh, at the time of the procedure. Uh, and of course, the chance of successfully closing a perforation in the duodenum completely depends on the location of the lesion. If the, if the lesion, in my experience, is kind of in the 12 o'clock position, it's really difficult to close that endoscopically. It's much, much easier kind of at 6 o'clock or at 3 o'clock, but at 12 o'clock or at 9 o'clock, it's difficult. Mind you, if the average size of a lesion is only 6 millimeters, then that must have been a tiny perforation. Of course, we don't really know how, what to make of lymphovascular invasion seen in uh, histological analysis of NET lesions. We, we go by the WHO score the, based on the proliferation index. And the higher the proliferation index, the more we worry about these lesions. The treatment strategies have really been outlined in some detail in the stomach. Uh, you can look at my at our previous podcast on that topic. But the duodenum is, is more difficult. Fortunately, after a mean follow-up of three and a half years, there were no local recurrences. So that is actually reassuring. Chatting to friends, I have had colleagues who had have had 
disastrous perforations with removing larger NETs from the duodenum. So I would urge caution uh, about removing anything from the duodenum. The, this study confirms it's tiger country, but does give us some reassurance about the long-term outcome after the removal of duodenal NETs. Now the final study on the topic of uh, endoscopic resections and polypectomy comes from Denmark and published by Trollsen, Sørensen and Crockett in Clinical Gastrohep, um, 26th of May this year, entitled Characteristics and Survival of Patients with IBD and Post-Colonoscopy Colorectal Cancer. Uh, as I said, the study is from Denmark where they have a, a comprehensive database that trawled the database over a 20 year period and found 24,000 patients with colitis and 352 patients with cancer. They concluded that patients who presented with cancer within three years after colonoscopy were more likely to have metastatic disease, that's 33% of patients with a post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer, versus only 20% of patients who had a colonoscopy detected cancer. Of course, these post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer probably had a couple of years uh, longer to develop metastatic disease. So it's uncertain if, uh, if kind of stage for stage, patients with uh, post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer is kind of more aggressive. But post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer had a higher risk of uh, harboring mismatch repair deficiency mutations. 80% uh, of post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer cases had a mutation in the mismatch repair gene compared to only 56% in patients with screening detected cancers. Authors concluded that the tumor biology seemed to be different in the post-colonoscopy colorectal cancers, but that the prognosis stage for stage might be similar in detected cancers and post-colonoscopy cancers. This is all, of course, all very interesting, but the bottom line is that if you, if you work in the NHS and don't want to have another root cause analysis, then you should bow out of uh, screening patients with colitis for early neoplastic lesions. And in your consent form, you should probably quote a one in 70% risk of a missed significant lesion. That's what I put down in these patients compared to the one in 300 risk I quote for patients attending for a diagnostic colonoscopy. At the moment, I don't actually quote the risk of missed significant lesions in patients attending for a therapeutic colonoscopy because I don't actually even pretend to carry out a thorough examination of the colon. Patients attending for a polypectomy, they get exactly what it says on the tin. They get their polyp removed, but no pretense of having scrutinized or exonerated the rest of the colon. Imagine if you referred a patient with a sizable lesion in the transverse colon. You, you then have a 45 minute time window to remove that lesion. Should you then squander that on a full diagnostic colonoscopy from going to the cecum all the way back, having a look at everything, probably takes you 20 minutes or so, 15 perhaps, and then go back in again and spend the rest, well, half of your therapeutic window at trying to do what you're actually asked to do, remove the polyp. I say no to that. I want to spend the 45 minutes on the important objective of the procedure, i.e. to remove the polyp. The National Endoscopy Database, I don't think, makes there any distinction between uh, post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer rates in patients with a diagnostic or a therapeutic colonoscopy. Now, moving on to the biliary tract, we have a study from Thailand uh, entitled Diagnostic Performance of Cholangioscopes in Patients with CBD Strictures. It's a systematic review and meta-analysis, and basically, this study, published in Surgical Endoscopy, looked at prospective and randomized trials of cholangioscopy versus histology to diagnose malignant CBD strictures. <laughs> not, as, not surprisingly, there were only 13 studies with a total of 876 patients. And basically, to cut a long story short, cholangioscopy had a sensitivity of 93% versus 82% for histology. And that basically means that cholangioscopy correctly detects 93% of patients with cancer, 
versus 82% who are correctly diagnosed with histology. But the kick in the groin was that the corresponding specificity wasn't very good. 86% for cholangioscopy versus 98% for histology. And as you probably now quickly realize, that means that 14% of patients with cancer is missed by cholangioscopy versus only 2% of patients with true cancer being missed with histology. So clearly, uh, we still haven't moved on to a reliable endoscopic diagnosis and still have to biopsy these lesions. No surprise there then. Now we're moving on to the topic of bleeding. There was a study published in Gastroenterology uh, by the Bavene Corporation Study Group, that's basically in Spain, but authors from Romania, France, Switzerland and China were also included in this study published in Gastroenterology entitled Effects of Early Placement of Tips in Patients with High-Risk Acute Variceal Bleeding and Meta-Analysis. The background to this is that, uh, of course, it's been shown in the past that in patients with high risk of variceal bleeding, you can place a TIPS and that will reduce the risk of bleeding, kind of a preemptive TIPS, particularly in child score A. But of course, that's a hard sell because most of these patients won't actually bleed. It's much more important to know how about dealing with patients with a higher child Pew score, say of B and C, who's actually bleeding, uh, presented with bleeding. And this is what this meta-analysis were looking at. They found um, seven studies comprising 1,327 patients and basically concluded that uh, preemptive tips significantly increased the proportion of, of patients who uh, survived a year compared to endoscopy and beta blockers. And this survival benefit remained the same in both child A and B score patients, and even in child Pew score C, if they scored below 14 points. And finally, this preemptive tips uh, improved control of bleeding and ascites without increasing the risk of hepatic encephalopathy. Now, I've been envious of the interventional radiologist for some time and recorded a case in Leeds when the patient had three bleeds from the fundal varices before we sent the patient for angiography. And the angio boys, they uh, embolized the fundal varices, they put a stent through the splenic uh, vein th uh, thrombus, and they even put a tips in for good measure. And of course, the patient did very well. And afterwards, I was wondering, why didn't we send that patient for angiography earlier? These guys got very powerful kits in their toolbox and uh, can clearly achieve things that we simply can't achieve uh, with endoscopic means. I remain convinced that uh, angiography should be employed earlier rather than later in the uh, management algorithm of these patients. Now, on the topic of bleeding, we have an ESGE guideline on acute lower GI bleeding and uh, published in endoscopy in, in the June. And I, <laughs> I read the headline uh, and I wonder why, why bother do a, um, a guideline on this topic? Because uh, acute or emergency colonoscopy in this group of patients have not been shown in any studies to actually confer any benefits. So I do guideline on it. But of course, there are sensible things to cover. And uh, and the ones to flag up from this guideline is that uh, in a patient who's hemodynamically unstable and admitted with a lower GI bleed, then actually what you should do is not send them for colonoscopy, is to organize an angiogram beforehand to get some radiologist help in locating the, the segment of bleeding. The ESG then recommends that colonoscopy should be formed at some time during the hospital stay because there's no high quality evidence that early colonoscopy actually influences patient outcomes. Now there are issues with that guideline of course because um, it's really tricky to get uh, good bowel cleansing in inpatients and uh, patients are usually very keen to go home rather than stay in an extra couple of days. So there's a strong argument for I think, for not doing any inpatient colonoscopies. Anyway, be that as it may, sensibly, the ESG also recommends not stopping the aspirin 
the aspirin is there for a reason and you don't want the patient to have an MI or a stroke just because you ill-advisedly stop the aspirin. Furthermore, patients on uh, it was called P2Y12 receptor antagonist, that's clopidogrel, ticragrel or emprasagrel, should not have these drugs stopped before you've spoken to the cardiologist about it. And if you do stop it, the drug should probably be restarted within five days if it still is indicated. Now, finally, we have a study from Pakistan on the topic of ergonomics in endoscopy. The study is entitled Ergonomic Injuries in Endoscopists and Their Risk Factors. It's published in Clinical Endoscopy, May edition. 95% of endoscopists complained of some musculoskeletal injury, compared to 54% of non-endoscopists. The main problem was back pain, 41%, leg pain, 23%, and pain in the hand, 20%, amongst endoscopists. And... Uh, the frequency of musculoskeletal problems were higher in doctors doing more procedures on the weekly basis. Clearly, ergonomics is an important issue, and I think a neglected issue in endoscopy. For goodness sake, make sure that the examination trolley is at the right level, possibly a bit higher than you expect, so you, it forces you to stand straight without being stooped over. That's how you get back pain. Neck pain, in my experience, you get if you put the endoscopy screen kind of at an angle. So instead of looking straight ahead, you kind of at a 20 degree or 30 degree angle. For goodness sake, make sure that the screen is square in front of you. So you don't need to stand kind of with a twisted spine. The third thing to avoid, of course, is, is to abuse your left hand thumb and fingers. If it's a tricky corner, don't be shy about letting go of the, the shaft of the scope to use your right hand to turn the wheels. Of course, for a purist, that is crazy. That's akin to a violinist letting go of this bow and using both hands to prinkle the um, the strings. It's a ridiculous <laughs> advice if you're Japanese. But I think, I think it's, it's, it shows a bit of kindness towards your long-suffering thumb. Another not uncommon issue that I've heard of is... Um, carpal tunnel syndrome in the right hand. Anyway, that concludes today's trawl of interesting endoscopy papers. I hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to see you again in a few weeks time. And thanks again to our sponsors from Pentax Medical, who's making this podcast viable. Thanks a lot and see you soon. Bye. Imagine a world where every single detail is designed to save lives. Where everyone works for the benefit of patient health and comfort, as well as clinical institutions. By delivering cleverly engineered technology and dedicated services to support your fight against diseases, cancer, and infections. A world where you will always find smart and sophisticated answers to your daily challenges. This is the world of Pentax Medical. Welcome to the world of intelligence.